Uh, thanks, Sonso. It was quite inspirational. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is a renowned expert in strategy and entrepreneurship. Listed among the top 50 thinkers, he is well known for his 14 books, including the latest bestseller, Fast Forward. These days, Professor Julian is working on an exciting new research, which is about reinventing the institutions of capitalism for the digital age, where he is finding out how the digital age behemoths like Google, Amazon, they are creating the rules for the new capitalism. Let's hear more about this research from Professor Julian. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in putting your hands together to welcome Professor Julian Birkinshaw. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I'm conscious that I was here two years ago, and I suspect many of you were here two years ago, and certainly I recognize quite a few of the audience as people who I've, who I've lectured to, spoken with over the last few years. So I was at pains to sort of make sure what I talked about today was not what I usually talk about. It was very much kind of the next step in my own thinking about these important issues. Uh, so that's a rather scary title, Reinventing the Institutions of Capitalism for the Digital Age. I'm not sure I'm going to completely do justice to it, because this is kind of the start of my next project, rather than looking back on the previous project. Uh, so this is kind of bleeding edge stuff, if you see what I mean. Do not believe everything I tell you in the next 30 minutes. If you think that what I'm saying is complete nonsense, please tell me after the break, if you say. <laughs> um, and if you've got some gentle provocations, ask me about them in the questions that we take uh, as soon as I finish speaking. Uh, let me start with, with this uh, famous chap, Ray Kurzweil. Some of you have come across him. He's a futurist. He's a, you know, a guru in Silicon Valley. He wrote this famous book called The Singularity. And so just as we saw Arthur C. Clarke earlier, what we see here is this, this guy who's peering into the future. And his view is that information-based technologies will encompass all human knowledge and proficiency, including pattern recognition powers, problem-solving, emotional and moral intelligence of the human brain itself. Artificial intelligence is taking over the world. And of course, even if you don't go all the way to where he would like us to believe that is that artificial intelligence will, shall we say, have caught up with human intelligence by, I think it's the year 2035, we can all agree that we are seeing things happening in the technological innovation space which we didn't even believe were possible in our lifetimes. Autonomous vehicles, for example. I think many of us uh, are completely perplexed as to how quickly that has moved on. So what I want to do is I want to take this notion that artificial intelligence technology is developing at exponentially increasing rates. And I want to say to myself, what are the things that are going to happen to us, for individuals, for firms, and for governments? I'm not going to spend very long, actually, on the first question. What are the implications of the technology revolution for us as individuals? There's a lot of talk about how jobs are disappearing. Because, of course, artificial intelligence is taking away not just traditional laboring jobs, but also a lot of white-collar jobs, a blue-collar job, excuse me, of, of, yeah, the sort of jobs that you and I have. Uh, and that's kind of scary. And the question about whether e there is even enough work to go around in the future is something that a lot of people worry about. I'm actually going to focus on the second and third of those two questions in this half an hour. I'm going to spend 15 minutes on firms and 15 minutes on government. So in some ways, these are two slightly separate talks, but they are linked by a point of view about how we need to respond to the way that the digital revolution is affecting the business world. So let me just focus for, for now on artificial intelligence and how that is affecting what it is that makes firms unique. This is a definition of artificial intelligence. I'm not going to spend any time on this. I just want to make sure that we're clear. It's about technology increasingly taking on the things that we humans used to think of as our preserve. And the best way of illustrating what that looks like, this is a beautiful metaphor from Hans Moravec. Essentially, we can picture a landscape where there are things that humans do and things that humans have always done. Uh, and gradually, the water level in terms of what technology can do is rising. And gradually, as that water level rises, 
that metaphor suggests that there are things that we used to think as uniquely human which are now actually being done by computers. So we've got the famous story about uh, chess and then Go and Jeopardy, various games that computers can now do undoubtedly better than humans. But then we've got many other things, fear improving, book writing, science, designing artificial intelligence itself. These are sort of higher order things that we like to think of as being things that only humans can do. But sure enough, the water level keeps on rising and rising and rising. And we don't know how far that water will rise. And so everything I'm going to say about what is sort of uniquely human or uniquely uh, the preserve of business, um, some of you will challenge that and say, well, you know, that may be true today, but it won't be true in 10 or 20 years. And that's, that's fine. That's a debate which will continue to evolve. So we are indeed looking at computers getting better at doing stuff that we used to be thought, thinking of as ours. But rather than thinking in terms of what's left for humans, in terms of intuition and creativity and general intelligence, I actually want to think about what's left for business, what's left for firms, what are the limitations of artificial intelligence for business. Or perhaps an even sharper way of asking the question is what are the unique qualities of firms that need emphasizing as artificial intelligence becomes more powerful. As we look at this technological revolution, we are seeing the emergence of what are sometimes called smart contracts. Contracts which are created by computer, which can be executed by computers without any human involvement. In the far kind of sort of, sort of frontiers of technological change, we are seeing the emergence of what are called decentralized autonomous organizations, which are designed to be literally organizations where there is no human involvement at all. And realizing that, I actually started thinking to myself, well, hang on, what is it about a firm that is uniquely firm? Like, what is it that firms actually need to do in order to, shall we say, stave off, if you like, the rise of computers? And it's a very fundamental question. Some of you will recognize this chap, Oliver Williamson, Nobel laureate. He wrote the original, not the original, but the most influential piece of work on the reason firms exist, building on the work of a chap called Ronald Coase, who some of you might have heard of. And he basically says, you might have heard of transaction cost economics, he basically said, firms exist to do stuff that markets cannot. Firms exist to coordinate and internalize the complex transactions between individuals and between other firms in order to make them work more efficiently. And that transaction cost view has been you know, it's part of our discussion for, for 30 or 40 years, right? And many of you in the room have, have read about it. But if that's all firms do, then we've got a problem. Because a firm as a nexus of contracts, if you think about it, artificial intelligence is very, very good at managing contracts. If I take my Alexa, which is sitting on my kitchen table, and I say, Alexa, order more dog food, that sets off a series of transactions whereby at some point, 24 hours later, a bunch of dog food arri arrives in my house without very much human interaction whatsoever. I mean, of course, there are some humans involved. The, the product has to be physically shipped. But whether it's through Amazon, the company, or whether it's through Amazon third parties, there is a whole series of transactions which are done much more efficiently than ever used to be through the computer system. So the, the logic of why firms exist cannot just be about internalizing transaction costs, because if that's the case, then we're going to have fewer and fewer firms in the years ahead. So this is the thought experiment. What are the things that make firms uniquely special? What are the things that firms do better than markets? That is actually a non-trivial question, because if we're thinking about how our firms can stay ahead of others, we actually need to emphasize these qualities rather than just to sort of assuming them away. And I'm going to suggest four things. I can't say this is comprehensive, but four things that firms do better than markets and better than computers. They are very good at managing and resolving tensions. Some of you have come across this notion of ambidexterity, ambidexterity, organizational ambidexterity. Firms exist to do two things. They exploit their existing assets. They explore for new opportunities. Computers can do one or other of those Computers are very good at helping us to exploit our existing assets. Artificial intelligence today even allows us to be creative. If you, you can actually create Picasso-like paintings using computers now. 
you can actually create entirely new musical scores. But what the computers can't help us with is the balance between those, right? The choice to invest more money, for example, in doing new stuff at the expense of the other stuff, to make sure that we've got the right balance between the intangible and the intangibles. So that's the first thing that we, we as individuals working for firms have to be very thoughtful about managing those tensions to get the balance right to enable our long-term survival as a company. And the related point is we don't just make trade-offs and manage tensions in the moment. We also manage these tensions and trade-offs over time. I had a former colleague, some of you may even remember him, Sumantra Ghoshal. He died, what, 10 years ago or so. Sumantra had this beautiful insight that actually what it is that firms do is they deliberately take resources out of their first best use in a way that the market would use them and deliberately takes them and puts them somewhere where they are actually in the short term being less productive in order that they have the potential of being more productive later. One step back, two steps forward. It's a very clever argument about what it is that firms do and the, the easier way of kind of making the same point is that firms, firms take a long-term perspective in a way that markets do not and indeed have never done. And I would argue that artificial intelligence is not well equipped to do that sort of thing. Jeff Bezos is famous for saying, I think you have to be willing to be misunderstood in order to innovate. When we see ambiguity in terms of how technologies are evolving, we as leaders have to be prepared sometimes to deliberately say, we are going to do something before we even need it because we need to build the capability to be positioned for that future. And as I say, that ambiguity, that uncertainty about making the trade-offs across time is, I think, a very sort of uniquely kind of human thing. Third, what else do firms do that is uniquely firm-like as opposed to the short-term uh, things that markets focus on? Uh, they, they, they have a point of view and they use that point of view to grab, if you like, the discretionary effort of their employees. And we can use the word purpose to describe that. What is purpose? Purpose is a point of view on the future, but it's also what Ratan Tata calls a moral or a spiritual call to action. And if you think about what that means, it means that we are actually trying to capture the interest and excitement and, and as I say, discretionary effort of a whole bunch of people who buy into that point of view and are therefore able to actually do something about it. And I don't think I need to persuade you that people are, are, are motivated by intrinsic drivers. Anyone who works for a not-for-profit, you know, many of them work harder than the people who work in purely commercial terms. We know that that happens, but if you think about it, that is a, a, the essence of any sort of firm is that there is this moral, spiritual point of view that enables people to do more than they would if they were simply individual market transactors. And then finally, uh, and kind of most fun if you like, firms nurture unreasonable behavior. Many of you have heard me talking about this before. Unreasonable people, people like Elon Musk, are the ones who, they don't adapt to the way that the world works. They try to persuade that everyone around them to adapt to their point of view. They are unreasonable. They are trying to change things. They're often wrong as much as they are right. And if you think about it, computers, artificial intelligence, market-based systems, none of these things are really very good at handling the irrationality of these crazy people. And yet, if you think about it, we, in order to make progress, we need the contrarians to help us make progress. I'll just give you one example of what I mean by that. There's a lot of talk in the world of fund management about robo-advisors taking over the tussle, if you like, between the person and the machine. Robo-advisors don't just execute trades. Robo-advisors even advise us, tell us, if you like, what sort of trades we should be making based on our risk profile, but based on how long to retirement or whatever. If we allow the robo-advisors to make those decisions for us, to take the market in a particular direction. Uh, I saw this beautiful article in the FT. When it comes to investing, human stupidity beats artificial intelligence. I think the point he was making, I'm not absolutely sure, I think the point he was making was that actually, in order to beat the market, you've almost got to, by definition, go against 
the perceived wisdom in that market. And sometimes, you know, of course, humans are going to get it wrong as much as they're going to get it right. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not trying to say human stupidity will always win out. But in order for us to f spot, if you like, the uh, inconsistencies or the imperfections in the market, we need that leap of unreasonableness that takes us in the opposite direction, if you like, to where the sort of perceived standard way of thinking would tell us. So to put it all together, this is my um, summary, and, and some of you will recognize this as, as resembling something I've talked about before. You know, what is it that we need to succeed in this world where increasingly stuff is being done by the machines for us? Uh, we need much better human judgment. We've got to be much more thoughtful about how we blend the qualitative and the qualitative, the short and the long term, to do it in a decisive way, because obviously if we don't do it decisively, we get stuck in that whole analysis paralysis problem. And we also need what I like to think of as emotional conviction, which is an openness, if you like, to thinking differently. Uh, we need leaders who are able to inspire that extra effort on the part of everybody around them. And we need people who can create imaginative offerings. You know, think about Apple, Harley Davidson, think about your favorite uh, company whose brands people genuinely love. You know, that is, a, that is not some sort of, sort of standardized marketing approach used based on data. These companies have always created imaginative leaps forward that no computer system in the world could ever help us with. So we need a little bit more emotional conviction within our organizations. And these are the essence, if you like, of what it is, I think, that make firms more effective in the long term than the computer-oriented market-like systems which are encroaching upon us. So that was part one. Part two is, as I say, a deliberately different angle on the same challenge of, as we see this digital revolution taking off, we have to think differently about the role of governments. My, head, my heading was institutions of capitalism to support the digital age. And there's a kind of a lot in there. So let me try to, to offer this to you as a way of giving you an I idea about how things, I think, need to shape up. I will just say as an aside, this is literally the first time I've ever presented the next five or six slides. So you are, for better or for worse, the guinea pigs here. So historical context. I'll just pull all these up in order to stay on track. Take a little bit of a thought about what I mean by the institutions of capitalism. Go back to the original industrial period, the governance and legal forms of companies. That was created in the 1850s. The rules around how employees worked, the rules around intellectual property, the competition authorities, the rules around order and measurement. If you think about it, for firms to exist and be successful, they need a set of institutions that support their activities. And over that period from the 1850s to the 1920s, what happened was a whole set of institutions emerged that were designed to support what you might call industrial activity. So we created antitrust laws to protect customers. Uh, we created accounting systems which focused, of course, on the tangible assets of the day, equipment and machinery and, and capital, and so forth. And those institutions did a very good job of helping to take the opportunity afforded by the Industrial Revolution and to turn it into hugely successful companies. And of course, that industrial model has stayed with us over the last century or so and is now, I would argue, under some sort of threat in a positive way because, of course, the rules of business, as we've already said, are shifting from a, a logic based on industrial activity to one based on digital activity. We're not completely getting rid of industrial companies, but you just take a look at the top 10 most valuable companies in the world today, seven of the top 10 are just basically digital companies, the famous fangs. And so if I'm trying to put this argument into a picture, it looks like this. You've got the industrial age, classic business model that many of us grew up with. And we've got a series of bureaucratic and hierarchical mechanisms for making those work. And over the years, a set of institutional structures took shape to enable this set of activities to work well. But we've shifted, I would say, over the last 20 or 30 years, and that shift is still underway, towards what I like to think of as a digital age system. 
And let me just pick up on a couple of points. The, the big successful companies, the Googles, the Apples, and the Facebooks, and the Amazons, right? These are companies who are built on these so-called platform-based business models, where there are increasing returns to scale. You know, they give you access to scarce assets rather than necessarily giving us ownership of those scarce assets. They are in a world which Brian Arthur talks about as the increasing returns world rather than the decreased returns world. And the organizational models that are used are, many of you have heard me talking about this, I think I talked about it two years ago, much more ad hoc, much more fluid, much more bottom up. But the key question here is what are the institutional structures that we need to support this digital set of activities. And when we see stories about Facebook in the news, when we see stories about Uber in the news, what I'm going to suggest is that those stories all boil down to a mismatch between the new business models that these companies are exploiting and the institutional structures which are still a little bit stuck in the industrial age thinking. There's always a process of institutional lag where the institutions take a while to catch up with what's happening. Let me just explain what I'm saying in terms of four examples. I'm going to take you briefly through four of these institutions. The original limited liability company. Some of you don't even know the origins of this, I would bet. There's a famous book written by the current editor of The Economist magazine, John Micklethwaite and Adrian Wooldridge. It was called The Company. It basically took us back to the 1850s, where the original limited liability company was created as a mechanism, if you think about it, for separating out the personal liability we have as individual leaders and the liability of this thing that we're calling a company. And by separating out own liability, it actually made it possible for companies to take a bit more risk, to do things which were helping to grow business. And of course, that was a hugely successful vehicle for creating wealth and prosperity in the industrial era. And I don't think I need to persuade you that there's a lot of pressure nowadays on these so-called limited liability companies, particularly around this issue about are they a little bit short-termist in their thinking? Have we got ourselves into a world where you know, the stock market uh, pushes leaders to do things which are actually not in the interests, the long-term interests of all the other stakeholders because short-term shareholders hold most of the power? Lots of reasons to be worrying about the, the benefits of that model which was created in that industrial era. Someone showed me some data recently. The number of companies which are taking themselves out of the stock market, moving from being limited liability companies, particularly public limited liability companies, back into private ownership is huge. And so what we're now starting to see is this this proliferation of alternative models. Some, of course, private equity has been around forever. Private equity has made a resurgence. The so-called B Corp, Benefit Corporation, is now a legal entity in the US and in Europe. It's a means of deliberately and explicitly agreeing that it's not just shareholders who are the beneficiaries of the cash flows from a company. Lots of alternative governance structures emerging, I would argue, because this model was well suited to the industrial age and now we've moved into this digital age where a number of different governance models are more appropriate. So that's point number one. I'm going to give you three other institutions which need to adapt. The second one is the rules around ownership of assets and particularly ownership of intellectual property assets. So if you know anything at all about the world of intellectual property, right, the, the dominant way of thinking about it is that I want to own these things. I want through copyright law, through trademarks, whatever it is, to have ownership of my assets in order that I can then extract value from them. And what is increasingly happening, particularly in the world of software, but not exclusively, is we're seeing a very different logic emerging, one around much more collective ownership. Some of you have heard of the general public license for software, the Creative Commons, the copyleft movement. These are all terms which some of you are fami very familiar with, but many of you are not. They're all about this logic that says, if we're going to create software that is going to create value for us for collectively in the future, we can't have Microsoft owning it. What we need is to have a, a platform such as Linux, where there is a collective level ownership, we have a, a, a general license. If I want to use Linux software, 
I'm allowed to use it however I see fit, as long as any changes I make to it are then put back into that common pool. So that open view of ownership is much more suited, of course, to the digital age. This is a digital age view. This is an industrial age view. So this general public license is all around freedom of software rather than the idea that somebody would own it. And I think that when we start seeing stories about Facebook in the news for all the wrong reasons, and you know these stories as well as I do, what we're starting to see is a proper debate about who does actually own information. And we've had a very, very difficult time of figuring out a way of establishing ownership rights around and, if you like, sort of rules around the secrecy and privacy of information. And, and I don't know where that one ends up, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I do absolutely understand the EU regulations, GDPR, which is about giving us ownership of our own information. But we've got to be very thoughtful about the need to come up with better ways of actually using this information to protect us as individuals, but in order that society as a whole benefits. Okay, two more points. The, the nature of the worker. You know, the, the word employee doesn't have any great resonance as something unusual for any of us. But I read this fascinating book by Roy Jack Jakes, who showed that the term employee was actually invented in the industrial revolutionary period as a means of explaining why it is that as an individual, rather than working as a, as a labor, uh, working in a farm or working as a trader, you would actually give up your sole trading rights in order to work for a large, autonomous, and ultimately kind of anonymous company. So the concept of the employee as the, you know, uh, as the worker who's disconnected from the fruits of their labor, that came out of that industrial revolutionary period. And of course, that's one of the reasons that Karl Marx, for a while, was in the ascendancy as a, as, a, as, a, as a challenge to that model. What I would say is happening now is that workers are increasingly, and there's lots of evidence for this, right, having the opportunity and indeed taking the opportunity to work as freelancers. And so there's lots and lots of words for that. That word cloud is just capturing some of it. So the point is that increasingly the digital revolution makes it possible and sometimes desirable for people to move away from that traditional idea that they are an employee of somebody else. And we need, the key point is, we need institutions to help us to manage that transition. There was a famous case in California when it was Uber and Lyft and some of these other ride-sharing businesses um, were being taken to court by the drivers. And the judge in this case, Vince Chabria, said, the jury will be handed a square peg and asked to choose between two round holes. In other words, am I an employee or am I a freelancer? Uber, Uber, Uber drivers are neither one nor the other. And as he says, you know, we've got this 20th century solution in terms of job titles to solve a 21st century problem. And what we're starting to see happening, albeit slowly, is the emergence of hybrid categories, a third category, if you like, that sits somewhere between the traditional employee and the traditional uh, self-employed person. And there's lots behind that which I'm not going to go into right now. Britain, in fact, it turns out, is actually quite advanced in terms of thinking about the three or four, or even five different categories of workers in terms of their relationship with the companies with whom they are working and their rights and freedoms in that work. So that's another tension. And then the final one is very much in the news today. It's around competition policy. In the good old days, right, we knew a monopolist because the monopolist was charging monopoly rents. In other words, the monopolist was gouging the customer. They were charging them too much for their product. And indeed, the entire competition law has been built primarily around this test about we know monopolist because prices are too high. Well, you know where I'm going with this, right? Because when we look at the Amazons and the Facebooks and the Googles, some people think of them as monopolists, but they are monopolists who are giving products away. And it's very difficult to get your head around just how, if at all, these types of new monopolists should be regulated. So we know, well, we know what's going on, right? I mean, they are giving a product to us for free, but what they're actually doing, the trade is, you know, they are taking our data 
and using that to, as it were, to sell on to use in other ways. But my point is that because we haven't put a price on user data, we don't know quite how to regulate these things. So all I'm saying right now is when we have a debate about surely we need to regulate Amazon and Facebook and Google, surely they've become too big and too dominant, it is very, very difficult to do that using competition law as it has been created because that competition law was created for a completely different era where, as I say, we knew a monopolist because of the prices they charged. So that tension is still as yet unresolved. So to put it all together, we have a story, as I say, whereby the institutional structures which are supposed to be supporting capitalism, helping businesses to prosper, and also obviously helping the public, public cause, those institutions are stuck. They're stuck halfway between the classical world of the industrial model which they were invented in and the digital world we're in today. There is a, an institutional lag, if you like. There are tensions, and every time we see a big battle between business and regulators and society, it's almost always at the heart of that is this problem that we're trying to take you know, 20th century rules and, and use them to apply to 21st century problems. So I'm going to finish there. Summary of what I said in the last 10 minutes is the following. The digital age has enabled huge amounts of business model innovation. So entrepreneurs, you know, the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, developing new ways of creating value. But those institutions that support them are a bit stuck. And so what we actually need is more, I'm going to call it, institutional innovation. We need more people prepared to challenge those rules and to come up with better ways of actually governing companies and intellectual property and things like that. There's a very famous chap in the world of software called Richard Stallman, who, from MIT, actually. I mean, he was the, he was the guy behind the whole Creative Commons um, innovations that allowed computer systems such as Linux to be created in an open source way. Those people are the institutional innovators, and frankly, I think we just need a whole lot more of them. So that is the ideas. I'm going to stop there. Hopefully, I've at least sort of provoked you into thinking a little bit differently about a few important issues, and I guess we've got a little bit of time for questions. Thanks very much. Okay, so I'm not sure, am I, am I supposed to be just focusing on the ones on the screen? Well, if AI can replace jobs, why can't it replace firms? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and of course, that's the, that's the, heart, that's the heart of my argument, isn't it? Which is that if, if, if a firm was simply a set of contracts, then artificial intelligence absolutely can replace it. And yet I'm arguing that there are these higher order human capabilities, which are analogous to firm level capabilities which are at the sort of the top, the mountain peaks, if you like, in that image I showed you right at the beginning. And so I think that that debate is going on. And of course, some of you will say, well, hang on, there's nothing to stop computers doing having that sort of general capability that firms have. But I would argue that that is a, a long, long way off. Compared with a traditional hierarchical company, do you agree that a private equity portfolio of similar businesses can offer network benefits from voluntary collaboration? Okay, this is a long question. Uh, between management teams, compared with a traditional hierarchy, I mean, private equity portfolios, similar business. So look, gosh, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge academic debate around the benefits of private equity portfolios compared to more integrated firms. And of course, the simple point I would make there is that you know, if you're running a portfolio of companies in a private equity world, you know, you're, you're, you're not trying to create lots of linkages between them. What you are trying to do is to figure out what is your unique insight or value added as the owner of those assets that allows you to create value for your ultimate owners. And a large part of that, quite honestly, is around the size and scope of your portfolio, knowing when to buy activities, knowing when to sell them. And then there's a few clever strategic things you can do. You know, some of you will be aware, with, uh, aware of the Vision Fund, which was created by out of SoftBank, uh, Masa Son is the guy running it, right? I mean, he owns stakes in all these driving co riding companies, you know, Uber and Didi and, and all the other ones around the world. You know, he's clearly being very strategic in terms of trying to get some of these ride-sharing com companies to work together. So there are clever things you can do. 
but I would argue that you've got to be very careful before you become too, become too wrapped up in, in the opportunities to add value to your portfolio companies. How much longer before AI replaces LBS? Professor says, yeah, well, not in my lifetime. That's a, <laughs> that, of, <laughs> of that, I'm sure. <laughs> um, no, I mean, look, how long is that? Yeah. Um, are the things that AI can do to enrich the quality of the learning experience? Absolutely. And this is, this, and, and one of my jobs at LBS is I'm heading the digital activities. And we're trying to figure out ways of doing more blended learning. And of course, the nation of blended learning is that we're never going to get rid of this face-to-face -face stuff with the, with the professor. I mean, that's been around since Socrates' day, right? But there's a whole bunch of the stuff that you do much better through an automated system in your own time and as we start experimenting at LBS with some of these blended models, that, of course, is what we're trying to achieve to get the maximum value out of these professorial interactions. Artificial intelligence encroaching on human capabilities. One problem is we don't know how tall the mountains actually are. Yeah. No, I, and I think that's right. Could they be always 30 years off? Actually, I do believe that. Um, I actually believe that, uh, and of course, this is an internal debate and that <coughs> movies have been made about it. But this notion that computers, we might have artificial general intelligence. General intelligence meaning the capacity of the computer to almost think for itself, the famous Turing test, is a million miles away. Lots of specialized bodies of intelligence are emerging. But the step towards general intelligence, or what's sometimes called superintelligence, again, definitely not in my lifetime. Are we out of time? Sorry? We are, oh, I got, I'm getting the, uh, OK. I'm going to stop talking. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you in the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you.